Does it say connecting on your screen? It does. Your light. Hi, everyone. Can you see us? Can you hear us? Please, thumbs up. There is a, a yes. You see, thumbs up. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everyone. We are really excited to have you here on board with us. And this is the panel Becoming Multiplanetary Species. Uh, I'd love to thank our panel for their willingness and genuine interest to participate in this conversation and spread the word about uh, human factors and uh, how we should and how we should, I mean, uh, what are uh, issues we're going to see in the future of uh, a multiplanetary, uh, becoming multiplanetary species. I'm the founder, I'm Anastasia. Uh, Prosina, moderator of this session today. I am a space architect, founder and CEO at Stellar Mentis. Uh, we provide uh, human-centered design services for space companies to make space habitat second homes. Uh, today, uh, we're going to discuss, as I mentioned before, the challenges uh, humanity will be facing when becoming, uh, while becoming multiplanetary species, and what you can do about it, how our culture, society, faith, and psychology is going to change. And let me introduce our panel. So uh, our speaker, the first speaker is Ariel Eggblow, is the founder and lead of the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative, a team of our over 50 graduate students, faculty actively prototyping our sci-fi space future across 40 plus in-house research, research projects. For the initiative, Ariel coordinates space research and launch opportunities across the spectrum of science, engineering, art, and design. Ariel's work has been featured in AIWA, Wired, MIT Technology Review, Harvard Business Review, The, World, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, the BBC, and more. And our second speaker today is Frank White. Uh, he has authored or uh, he has authored or authored numbers of books of, on topics ranging from space exploration to climate change to artificial intelligence. His best known work, the, Art, the overview of fact, space exploration and human evolution, is considered by many to be a, a seminal work in the field of space exploration. A film called Overview, based largely on his work, has has had nearly eight million plays on. Vimeo. So the, the, the panel is kicking off from the presentation uh, from our beautiful Ariel, and she's going to talk. She's going to talk more about what uh, space exploration initiative is doing, what kind of projects they're working on, and then um, Frank White will continue with his slides on discussing um, human space program as a center project of all of humanity and how overview of fact is an essential motive in space operation. After the presentations, we are all jumping in a conversation about what we are, what our challenges to humanity are uh, going to face while becoming multiplanetary species. So um, if you have any questions to the panel, please type them in the question tab. It uh, should be on the right. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in the end of this uh, session. So uh, let's kick off. Uh, please welcome Ariel to our virtual stage. <laughs> Thank you, Anastasia, for having me. It's a pleasure also to be speaking today with Frank White, who is a longtime hero of our organization as well. So it's a pleasure to get a chance to have a conversation with you. And let me get started. What I'm going to do here is share some overview slides about the Space Exploration Initiative at MIT. Just give me a second and we'll get these pulled up for everybody. Anastasia, are you able to see them now? Yeah. Okay, it's wonderful. Um, uh, please, please, hide, uh, please hide this, um, you know, I mean, uh, call me sharing your screen, hide. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Here we go. Um, so just uh, speak up and, and interrupt me if you need to pause because I can't see you guys right now while I'm presenting, but we'll go through this and then looking forward to all of your questions. So as Anastasia explained, I'm Ariel Akbla. I'm the founder and lead of the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative. We are a team of over 50 graduate students, staff, and faculty who work on a very broad cross-section of the future of life in space. 
So here, one of our motivating factors, you see an image of the Earth, and this is a photo taken from one of the Apollo missions in 1972. This is the way in which the photo was taken. And of course, it's not how we usually view photos from Earth. NASA often flips it and puts the Northern Hemisphere on top. But from a space perspective, there is no a priori preference for the Northern Hemisphere. Of course, we don't see any political borders or lines. And it's these types of images that helped, even going back to the, to the early 70s, found movements like the environmental movement because we're able to have this moment of perspective about the Earth. And so while you're about to hear lots of our different focus on space exploration projects, we very much have a principle at the Space Initiative that the work that we do should also come back down to benefit life on Earth. And we can do that through democratizing access to space, bringing more people and more disciplines into the work that is done to build technologies for space, but also by making sure that our work has spin-offs or applications that can be used by a broader, a broader part of the civilization on the surface. This is one of our taglines. We are designing, prototyping, and building our democratized space future. The image that you're looking at is an artist's vendor of 14 different projects from within the Space Initiative portfolio. So everything from space agriculture to mental health for astronauts and entertainment and VR headsets to robotics and even a self-assembling habitat that is rendered here on the outside. What we like to say is if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and others are working on the rockets to get us there, wherever there may be, Mars and beyond, we are working on the human lived experience of space. What is the suite of technologies, prototypes, experiences, products that we will want for a richly envisioned life in space? And for this, we really believe that you want scientists, like myself, I was trained as a physicist, but also engineers, artists, and designers co-developing this work for a truly enjoyable, multifaceted experience and a safe and rigorous experience when we're out exploring life in low Earth orbit, Mars, Moon, and beyond. To give you a sense of some of the different projects in the portfolio, of course, we are now working on over 40, so I can only show you a selection, but to give you a sense of some of the areas that are most interest to us, of course, space architecture. This is where my heart really lies. This is my PhD work, looking at the future of self-assembling space assets, but also the future of space health. Can we develop early stage diagnostics that pick up on potential biomarkers for disease or other issues for astronauts to better treat them preventatively or treat them early? Closed loop food technologies, soft robotics for the future of interior architectural elements inside of a habitat. And then even as far out as thinking about space silk, space suits and mobility, the future of fashion in space. It's a very broad portfolio. This is our team. We're really lucky to be working with some of the best people at MIT. It's absolutely a group effort. The uh, Space Initiative was founded as a grassroots organization. So we started with many different people coming together, realizing that we shared this love of space across our many different academic backgrounds. Maria Zuber is our co-PI in leadership at MIT. She's the vice president for research at the entire institute. And we're also very lucky to work with David Newman, who is the former deputy administrator of NASA and an advisor for the Space Initiative, along with my PhD advisor, Joe Paradiso, who leads the Responsive Environments Group at the Media Lab. This is our launch pipeline, our selections from our launch pipeline. We like to say that you are not a real space program if you're not actively launching into space. And so these are the different ways in which we get our research out there from zero gravity flights. We charter an entire flight each year, take 25 researchers and 14 experiments. We just completed six payloads being sent for a 30 day mission to the International Space Station. They launched on the CRS-20 launch and splashed down uh, a couple weeks ago. We're really happy to be analyzing the results from that. And of course, longer term, we're moving towards being able to support a lunar payload with Blue Origins Blue Moon Lunar Lander in 2024, as MIT and our suborganization were chosen as part of the select cohort of institutions to fly on the maiden flight, the very first inaugural voyage of the Blue Lunar Lander, Blue Moon Lunar Lander with Fortune. I have a quick video here, but I think I'm just going to skip it in the interest of time. It shows the SpaceX launch with our payloads, but you guys can also find this on the web. And what I'll do to close is just highlight something that is what, one of the things that we really love to share about the initiative, the ways in which it 
challenges some of the assumptions of what is what is worthy to send into space. Yes, we focus quite heavily on science and engineering, but this is actually an international open call arts payload that our arts curator, Shing Lu, curated, taking submissions from all around different countries and ultimately nine different artists were able to send small talismans, samples, everything from uh, small sculptures and figurines to bio samples to creative art and jewelry and were able to be packaged in these little units and sent to the International Space Station for a 30-day art and narrative mission with us through Shing's platform, Sojourner 2020. And here's a quick close-up of some of the beautiful samples that went and spent some time on their voyage to space. So that's it for the overview of the Space Initiative. If you have any questions, you can reach us on Twitter or at our website here. And I look forward to hearing from Frank and subsequently Anastasia and all of you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It was a really great learning experience. You know, learn, know what you're doing. Because <laughs> yeah, I heard you, you launched just yeah, yeah t like around 10 or 10 pilots. I'm sorry, I have Facebook on. We just launched, yeah, so we launched six payloads with um, Blue Origin Suborbital mm -hmm. last May. And then we've been continuing to promote and curate and incubate these projects. And we just had another batch of payloads launched and were returned already uh, from the International Space Station over the month of March, essentially. We're very lucky we actually got the launch off before the world has turned topsy-turvy um, with the current situations that we're all facing. So we were really lucky to be able to get those payloads up on that SpaceX launch beforehand and get our data results back. Yeah, that's that's really a great, great timing because yeah, everything's locked down now and the whole aerospace industry is really struggling. Um, anyway, please uh, welcome Frank to the virtual stage. He's going to give his own presentation. Yes, just a small right. clap. <laughs> Thank you, Anastasia. Let's see if I can get this going here. Um, Do you see the button below? I think we're getting there. Let's try this. There we go. Mm -hmm. There we go. Everybody yeah. happy? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yep. All right. Here we go. So thank you, uh, Anastasia and Ariel. It's just a great honor to be with you. Um, you are two leaders of the space movement, and I'm <laughs> just delighted to join you today. I'm going to talk about uh, space architecture and design in a broad way. And it's not going to focus so much on objects as on designing what I'm going to call a human space program. I want, I want to start out by having you imagine a world where you're inside most of the time, a world where you risk your life if you go outside. You have to wear protective clothing to leave your home. Uh, you might think I'm talking about uh, Mars, and, and I am, but it's also the Earth. I want to talk a little bit about the Earth and the COVID effect, as I'm calling it. I want to ask you, are we preparing ourselves for deep space missions? You know, um, when I talk to astronauts and I talk to a lot of them and ask, what did you get out of looking at the Earth from a distance? They so often say, I got that we're all in this together. This Earth is an interconnected whole system. We're all part of it. I've heard the astronauts say it. I've been preaching their gospel for a long time. <laughs> now everybody on the earth is saying we're all in it, in, in this together. Suddenly, in the space of a month or so, we're living in a completely different way. Now, you know, I want to be clear. There's nothing good about the virus. It's killing people. It's making people sick. It's bringing a lot of grief. And you know, there's not a lot of good about the lockdown we've experienced because of the economic pain, but there may be something for people like us who are interested in space exploration in the lockdown in that perhaps we are getting a sense of what it would be like to really go out into the solar system, leave our planet and live in a completely different fashion. 
And Frank, thank- Frank, sorry, one second. Could you please uh, turn uh, your slides into um, full screen mode? Like there's a slideshow you see in the top. Uh, there's slideshow um, on the bot on the top. Sure. Yeah, and then uh, play for. Um, where is that? Yeah, presenter view. I think. Okay. How's that? Oh. Eh. Could you go back? It's a uh, it's black screen right now. Mm. Mm. You're not seeing anything now. No. Okay. Oh, you said yeah. Could you please try uh, start um, slides from the current slide? I mean, could you go back? Oh yeah, that that oh. work. That's work. That's work. Great. Is this Great. good? Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. So I want to I want to invoke uh, Buckminster Fuller, a great designer, architect, and philosopher, a mentor of mine. You know, Bucky promoted the idea that we're living on a spaceship, spaceship Earth. He also made it really clear we we can't really go into space. We're already in space. The Earth can't be anywhere else but in space. We are the astronauts of planet Earth. If we had taken this project to Bucky, how would he have tackled it? I think he would have thought about it in a very large context as we are preparing to become what I call homo spatians. That is a different kind of person or maybe even a different species, really comfortable living off of planet Earth. I think he would have loved this iconic photo This is Tracy Caldwell Dyson, astronaut I interviewed at Johnson Space Center last month. And here she is doing what we call earth gazing. She is looking out the cupola on the International Space Station, and she just looks to be so happy and relaxed. Many of the astronauts tell me that they they found it surprising and counterintuitive how much they felt at home uh, being off of the planet. And you know, when you think about architecture and design, uh, the Mercury program, when they first started, the engineers said, the astronauts don't need a window, it's expensive, it's heavy, uh, just put them in, in, you know, in the spacecraft. The astronauts rebelled because they were test pilots, they were used to seeing where they were going, and a window was put in, and it was worthwhile because Alan Shepard was the first American to go into, into space, and he was astonished, and he he said, I could not be prepared for the beauty of what I saw. Similarly, the cupola was not originally part of the design for the International Space Station, and yet I've talked to so many astronauts. I go there, I relax, I look at the Earth, it's always different. And, you know, in a way, I think the astronauts would say, I don't know how I could do without Earth gazing. This is a hint. Think about the person. Think about the, the, the mental well-being when you're designing for having them live away from home. The other thing that people forget is that space exploration changes our consciousness. You've heard about the overview effect. That's really an understanding that the Earth is a whole interconnected system, and we're part of it. But in talking to astronauts, I've come up with some other terminology One is the Copernican perspective. Some of the astronauts start to see that we're actually part of another whole system called the solar system. Some astronauts have a breakthrough. They really connect to the entire universe. And one of the astronauts told me that the astronauts have a secret. And the secret is we're not just citizens of a planet. We're actually citizens of the universe. And we're very comfortable there. So the overview effect is this first change in consciousness that I've identified, and it is a shift in how astronauts and cosmonauts and other space travelers see themselves and our planet and our future. And if we're gonna start designing for people who are going to be part of a multi-planet species, we have to understand they're gonna think differently and experience everything differently than we do as surface dwellers. There's also going to be unintended consequences. Joe Allen was the first astronaut I interviewed from my book. And he said, for all the arguments pro and con for going to the moon, 
no one suggested that we should do it to look at the earth, but that may in fact be the most important reason. We need to build resiliency into our designs for uh, solar systems uh, settlement because things are gonna happen out there that we cannot anticipate. It's just going to be impossible to predict the next change in consciousness that we're going to see. But we get a hint, you know, some of the insights of the astronauts that are common is there are no borders or boundaries. My goodness, I thought, I kind of thought I would see a map. And why did I think that? I knew that wouldn't be the case, but there, there it is. They're struck by the incredible beauty of the earth and they tend to see the earth as fragile. Maybe it's not really fragile, but certainly our civilization on the surface is. And, you know, Don Lynn was a shuttle astronaut I interviewed early in my work, and he said, you can't see the boundaries over which we fight wars. And in a very real way, the inhabitants of this Earth are stuck on a very beautiful, lovely little planet in an incredibly hostile space, and everybody is in the same boat. The Pope recently said something very similar about we're all in the same boat. So we're all kind of getting astronaut consciousness, whether we want it or not. I just want you to think though, as you ponder going to live on Mars or some other planet, the really big difference between the blue marble and the red planet or any other planet in the solar system, the earth is full of life. It's full of oceans and clouds and atmosphere. It's perfectly suited for human habitation. I think Mars is quite beautiful. I, I love this picture of it, but it's certainly not the same. And just bear in mind, if you were on a, a Elon Musk starship or whatever he calls it, headed to Mars, you would experience the overview effect as you left our planet, but very soon you wouldn't see the Earth anymore and your attention would turn to Mars waiting for you, a very different place. So I, I think it's still, it's going to be hard, but I think our next step is living on an infinite frontier. We're going to move from a finite game to an infinite game. There's a great book on the internet on Amazon about that. And when you play a finite game, as we must on planet Earth, there are certain rules. And when you start playing an infinite game, the rules change. One thing I never hear people talking about is we are actually moving from a multi-species planet to be a multi-planet species. But what a profound change. Think about that. There are many species on Earth, but it's possible that other than our robots, we're going to be the only species on Mars or on the moon. We're not used to that. That is a profound change for us. And it's going to bring up many challenges, and they're physical, they're psychological, legal, ethical. How can you make a difference as a designer? You've got to think like a Martian, not an Earthling. Uh, one of the astronauts I interviewed at Johnson Space Center recently, Don Pettit, told me about how on the International Space Station, somebody had designed a table, and the astronauts were supposed to put their... Uh, their laptops on the table in order to work. And he realized, I don't need a table. That, that's earth thinking. I can just float here in zero gravity and type away. I, and his point was, if you've never been in zero gravity, you're gonna design tables. But if you've been there, you're not gonna spend time on that. I could talk in, on and on about this, but it would take up all our time. I just wanna, leave you with a really big issue, which is terraforming. Carl Sagan said, if there's life on Mars, we gotta, we gotta leave Mars alone. Uh, it belongs to Martians, even if they're only microbes, or I would say, even if they're only viruses. I, I ask you, what do you think Elon Musk would say to that? I don't think that's his perspective. And yet it really is a fundamental kind of ethical question it's a design question. It's an architectural question. How are we going? Are we going to change the solar system or is it going to change us? 
in thinking about this, I've come up with something I call the Cosmo hypothesis because it seems to me all our justifications for going into the solar system are benefits to us. But if we're going to be supported in this venture by the environment we're moving into, the new environment, how do we benefit the solar system or the universe? The hypothesis is that we actually have an ecological purpose in the universe. And, you know, Star Trek is famous for having a prime directive, which had to do with not interfering in the evolution of other forms of life. I've kind of modified it to say, as we move out there, we should give more than we take. Balance exploitation with exploration. And to implement that, I've proposed a human space program as a central project for all of humanity. You know, the overview effect is a unifying force, but once we leave and start migrating outward, we need a new unifying force. And I'm suggesting, and my team is suggesting, that we work to develop a blueprint for sustainable, inclusive, and ethical exploration and development of the solar system. This would be a grand plan, a big design um, <clears throat> that everyone could contribute to. So conclusion, conclusion is I don't have enough time to tell you everything I want to tell you. But uh, just to summarize, we have achieved an overview of our planet, which is a major evolutionary step. And the next step is to leave our planet or for some of us to do so and to begin settling uh, the solar system and becoming a multi-planet species. Everybody has a contribution to make. Ariel pointed that out. That's how they're running uh, their program. Space architects and designers can be a key influence. Just starting with this question, are we going to change the solar system or uh, are we going to change ourselves? to adapt to this new and dramatically different environment. We've shown as we've responded to COVID, we can make a lot of changes really quickly if we want to. It's really up to us. So I leave that to you as a question and maybe we can talk about it a little bit today. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Frank, so much. It was... Uh really great learning experience. You know, seeing the perspective of astronauts that they have this all of um, appreciate, uh, they all see the Earth from space perspective and understanding that there's no boundaries between us. We are all united and we are a uh, whole human family. This is really what should be uh, in one of the motive of the current situation as we are all in um, isolation, we are all, um, unfortunately, some of, some of us uh, lost lives, some of us, some of our relatives, they died. And um, we should be together and think together and come up with solutions how we can um, benefit, like how we can um, explore the stars, but also uh, care about Earth and care about citizens of Earth. And um, so one part, one part is if we stay on Earth together uh, forever, and then we there was, will be some eventual, ex sorry, <laughs> there will be some eventual existence, ex ex extinction event and then the alternative is becoming space-faring uh, civilization and uh, there is a window of opportunity it's around like 50 years so a window when we can become space-faring civilization and after which the opportunity uh, to do so um, will become too difficult or unpractical to pursue and considering natural events, available energy and human tendencies, uh, the timing to make the most effective effort to achieve multi status might be now before momentum is lost and we become distracted by ch um, challenging uh, energy um, problems. Um, so in that, um, 
according to Scott Hall, the space architect from NASA GPL, it could take around 26 years of um, semi-annual launches to build up such a self-sustaining um, human settlement. And the cost and commitment that has not been acknowledged not and planned for, and consider the time required to establish a multi-planet species, um, we should act as soon as possible because we might not I have such an opportunity to do so in the future. We might, not, we might be trapped and have this um, a deadful, deadful impactful event. Um, so considering the value of human space program as a central project for all humanity, how culture, society, faith and psychology will change while we are becoming a uh, space fair civilization. Ariel, uh, what do you think about? Can you repeat the end part of the question? So you're presenting the timeline on which we're considering becoming multiplanetary and the massive scale of commitment that's required to do that. And is the question, how do we obtain that as psychology and, and politics and technology yeah. needs to change to be able to do that? I think it's yep. a great question. People often ask, especially in the US context, if we achieved Apollo and the moon landing so many years ago, what kept us from being able to immediately see development of settlement at that time. And I think in some ways, Apollo was ahead of its time. If you look to the comparison of how, say, the US commercial flight ecosystem arose after the early 1900s and then really blossomed after World War II and became you know, the commercial way that we travel the world, it required more than just government investment to be able to get to the point where it was sustainable and was something that was really mass used and, and, and grew in that regard. And so I think we're beginning to see the same seeds of that ecosystem of the space community, and that it's not just government actors that are now the anchor tenants who are really getting involved to push it forward, but we're also seeing a proliferation of startup companies begin to succeed at scale, try to push forward towards settlement plans. Policy groups also spinning up to understand the importance of everything we do on the lunar surface will be set precedent. So we also need this ecosystem of thought policy and intentional governance and collaboration around the activities we do, and academics beginning to be able to say, all right, with these launch opportunities open to us, I can begin to plug in, which is really what we've seen as a benefit for our community. Now that we can charter with NanoRAP and SpaceX and Blue Origin and NASA and work with JAXA all the way across the globe, we're beginning to have enough of an ecosystem where smaller scale players like us can also get involved and try to thought shape what the future of space exploration looks like. So I think it really depends on achieving that 26 years of semi-annual launches, if that is, you know, something that Scott Howe believes in. I think what is needed for that is an ecosystem of responsible actors to be able to do their water to make. What's your opinion, Frank, on that? How society, how, uh, you know, the faith, how the the thing that we used to have, like the way how we used to have it on Earth, how are they going to change? Um, even like the, the way we speak, maybe, you know, the way we look. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> this concept of a central project was brought to to me by a friend of mine named Bruce Shackleton, who found it in an article. And a central project mm -hmm. is uh, something like building the Gothic cathedrals mm -hmm. or Apollo. But the, the important thing is it's a physical thing. I kind of agree with Ariel. You don't really have a space program if you're not launching. Um, but it's something you do physically, and yet it has larger dimensions, sociological, psychological, and spiritual. And also, an important thing Ariel talked about, everybody can plug into it. It's not just for scientists. It's not just for technologists. And you know, it's open to everybody. Uh, two things I would say about how do we get there. Um, one is it's not very well known that we were almost there in the 60s. Uh, we were talking about this before uh, we started. It isn't very well known that President Kennedy was reaching out to the Soviet leaders again and again saying, you know, we really ought to go to the moon together and maybe we just really ought to make it a, a multinational venture. And he gave a speech. He gave a speech at the UN two months before he died where he proposed a multinational program to go to the moon. So 
Of course, he was assassinated and it turned back into a competition. But the reason I bring that up is I think there are two elements that build into what Ariel's talking about. One is leadership at the top and the other is a grassroots movement. So President Kennedy was a, was a leader who could have brought that to, to fruition if he had lived. And we now do have a space movement. I don't think we have that leader, but we have that movement. And there's a big difference between a movement and a program. A movement is a bunch of people of different walks of life who are committed to a certain kind of future and they want to see it happen. And, you know, I'm sure uh, I'm a little older than you two, but uh, I remember uh, the early days of the movement when it was really a very small band of renegades. Um, there was no real entrepreneurial space. Uh, you know, a lot of what we talked about was confined to PowerPoints. But now we do have, we do, ha we do have commercial uh, enterprise as well as government, and we have ordinary citizens who are committed to this. So I'm pretty optimistic that we can do it. And my other point is, as we talked about before, the 60 launches, 70 launches, however many it takes, doesn't really matter if we're committed and if enough of us are committed. Um, we we overcome challenges as a species. We're really good at that when we're together. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I I also think that um, you know this um, <clears throat> the whole phenomenon that you have the ISIS and then there's all the nations um, they're working together in the, on the on the joint goal. It's what what fascinates me and fascinates many of us as space enthusiasts. Right. Um, um, so there is a question I really wanted to um, address. So Christopher is asking, is the first surface of the planet is the best place for a multi-planet species? Or it should be in you know, an orbital city? And I think, um, yeah, it's really a great question. There's mm -hmm. so, so much discussion on that. Ariel, what do you think about it? It's a great question. So the short answer is with our current biology, we'll definitely want to, to our best ability, recreate a gravity environment. That doesn't have to by any means be the surface of a planetary object, but you get it for free. If you're on Mars, you get a, you know, a fraction of the gravity that we had here, so that can be helpful. The alternative is thinking about building sophisticated enough orbiting habitats with motion to generate a, you know, a gravitational pull um, that would enable us to have what we need for our human biology, but also have the flexibility of growing orbital cities. My personal passion right now is thinking about the design of space architecture for orbiting environments, because I think it gives you this opportunity to, to see, as Frank often talks about so beautifully, a perspective of whatever planetary body you're around, but also the practical benefit of being above and outside somewhat of the gravity well that allows you to do shipping and exchange and perhaps set up the ports and eventually the space supply chains and logistics that we'll want for a truly multi-planetary species. And from a designer's perspective, what I love about building in an orbital environment is that you're not constrained by gravity. And so you can think about growing radially rather than building rectilinear. Uh, Frank, can you hear Ariel right now? <coughs> she, Ariel. She Ariel. Ariel's frozen. Oh, well, shall oh. I answer her until she comes back? Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I do agree with her perspective. And especially, you know, in zero gravity, in you know, a partial gravity well, um, we can experience, you know, extremely different um, um, aspects that we used to have on Earth. Uh, for example, like, the, where's the, you know, uh, the whole surface of, uh, of the interior habitat becomes, you know, ceilings. No, I mean, it becomes walls from any any perspective, so you can utilize it any anyhow. And hi, Ariel. All right, we miss you. <laughs> well, in the time of of COVID, my home internet just cut me off. But uh, I hope that answered at least partially the question. Our interest from a designer's perspective, using the affordances of microgravity to build in a different way than we would be able to build. Exactly. 
exactly. And uh, talking about overview effect, I think that is also like when we're going to first uh, build uh, space stations on the lower Earth orbit or lunar orbit, it's also important to have the view to our to to look directly to our planet as we are all Earthlings, as we are all belong, still belonging to it, right? But like in a few generations, we might, as we will have children on Mars, they might also orbit their own planet and um, on their orbital station, maybe maybe on one of the uh, moons of the of Mars, maybe Phobos or Demos, and see the their motherland from from the right. window. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that the connection to nature um, is extremely important to consider uh, when you're designing for space habitats as we are uh, not machines in machines. Um, so uh, there is also another question I wanted to address. Uh, so uh, we already answered it. So there's a question, how important is architecture in space operation? We already answered that. And then uh, what's what is economic impact on the habitat mission? Um, what's the economic impact on the habitat missions? So uh, do you have uh, could, any any reflections on that? Could, could you repeat the question? I couldn't quite get it. <clears throat> so uh, space architecture, what's it in what's its in economic impact on habitat missions? Like how do you um, you see there is always trade off between how like uh, what goes inside of space with that. So the best example is the ISS. It's an extremely, uh, you know, robust uh, configuration, and uh, it's all about uh, machines and uh, like how, you know, as putting as much payload as possible without organi organizing it in a, in a way that might be, you know, um, uh, support well-being. So, how, like, and also, you know, the private space sector, um, they found this. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of business could be built in space stations um, and also on different planets. So how is that? Uh, let me see. Yeah. I think I can, I have a, a couple thoughts, but I, I know I got to answer the first one or the last one. Yeah, first. yeah, Frank yeah, yeah. Jump in. Well, I think you, you all are, are very uh, keyed into this in the sense of the psychological aspects of our becoming multi-planet species. That is to say, we are really in a unknown territory uh, yeah. once we get out there. And, and we have to bear in mind, the people who go to the International Space Station are career astronauts for the most part. They are dedicated, they're committed. Uh, they're many of them since childhood, that's all they ever wanted to do. The fact that it may not be an incredibly comfortable environment doesn't really matter to them or it, it's not primary. So I think we really are going to see the impact of space architecture when we start having more casual journeys or what is called space tourists. Because space tourists, so-called, want to enjoy the experience. They want to have a good time. Uh, and I think they're not going to be as willing to put up with hardship. So sure. I think <clears throat> designing an environment where it'll be comfortable for people is going to be very important to more and more people being willing uh, to, to go out there. Then there's another category, I'll just leave it at that, which is space settlers who are more or less in between. Um, they are more like the astronauts. They're more willing to put up with difficult and challenging environment. But the architects, the designers are going to have to think about all these different categories. Yeah. Hardly hardly agreed with Frank in terms of the impact that space tourism would have on shifting the economics and then therefore shifting some of what we can focus on as designers for creating the worlds that we often see in science fiction. We're quite a ways away from that still. But 
it's important to remember exactly what Frank was saying, that the people who are currently going to space, they go in with a certain level of training and assumptions to be able to make space intriguing and palatable for more people. We also do need to begin to think of design beyond the survivalist realm. And we're quite fortunate to even be at the cusp where we can begin to be thinking of that. We really are standing on the shoulders of giants from NASA and ESA and many other groups that have been thinking about the ECLIS, you know, the, the life support technology and the radiation protective technology. But as we get at that cusp where we can begin to think beyond survivalist regimes and more into creative, how do you delight humanity when you're in these spaces? I think we have a great opportunity to think about it for economically beneficial ways to the question, but then also just for the sake of human experience and sharing this experience of space with more people. One of the interesting you know, leading voices in the space industry, Jeff Bezos talks about building a road to space. And so in some of the ways he benefited when founding Amazon by many different components for the ecosystem already being built. He didn't have to create UPS or the post office or e-commerce. And what he says he's trying to do now is build that level of infrastructure so that then the rest of us can, on top of that level of of preparedness begin to think about richly envisioned space habitats or playful space tourist experiences, um, or even making an economic argument that we begin to take hard manufacturing and destructive processes off the surface of our beautiful garden planet and try to see how we can do more of this in space with other resources or in a microgravity environment instead of in our lovely needs to be protected little gravity well. You know, it also goes back, uh, I would just say briefly, it goes back to this fundamental choice of the extent to which we change the solar system and the extent to which we leave it. Uh, one thing I think we might want to think about is, fortunately, in America and in other countries, there was a decision made to keep certain parts of the country wilderness, that there's a value in that. You know, we don't want every place to be settled and developed. And fortunately, for those of us who live in the United States, I don't know as much about other countries, but we can go to national parks and we can rough it. I mean, it doesn't have to be comfortable. So as we look outward, I think that we might want to think about that and think about whether there are certain value in preserving parts of the moon, parts of Mars, uh, in, in, in a natural state. Um, I think that's a, a really wonderful and critical consideration. And it makes me think of a colleague who I know Frank knows as well at MIT, Professor Danielle Wood, with whom we've had really wonderful conversations in the last few months about when we're thinking about all of this activity gearing up quite quickly to go to the surface of the moon, let's not take the assumption that it all needs to be resource extraction and infrastructure building. We really ought to also entertain ideas of why not make, for one, why didn't we think to make the entire moon an international park, like we have national parks. Now, maybe there are good reasons why that wouldn't be the best use of this commons for humanity, but it really is the commons. And so we should, to Frank's point, be thinking about how do we make that, how do we keep that balance between protecting and preserving and honoring beautiful celestial bodies, and then also understanding to what extent it's appropriate for humans to begin exploring them for use in our industrial economies and, and interest in furthering exploration because we do need resources for exploration beyond eventually the solar system and, and going further. But I think it's a wonderful point and something that we really do need to, to tease out. And Danielle Wood at the Media Lab, one of our colleagues, also thinks really, really thoughtfully about these topics. Yeah, I think it's really important and to have this mantle of uh, exp exploiting and exploring something. So we're going to use a lot of materials from the moon, like institute resource utilization, yeah. building our habitats. But also we should, some of the parts should be unexplored and left it as it is. I agree. And then there's a um, other question from Spencer Stanford. So if we as species need to make decisions on how we move it all out into the stars, then how do we decentralize space exploration? What technologies might allow us to involve as many people as possible for space exploration? On so the what, topic of mm -hmm. decentralizing makes me think of what are the gate keeper technologies. And of course, a big one right now is propulsion, 
We've seen fantastic strides be made by Blue Origin, SpaceX, and, and others thinking about reusable rockets, but I think the availability of a ticket, the availability of a ride to orbit is a, you know, a large limiting factor, and being able to democratize access to space eventually means being able to have more launches that are more economical, that are available to more, uh, that are available to broader swaths of, of humanity, and that in addition to just cost and thinking about technology development for better, cheaper propulsion, it's also safety and reliability, and how do we get it to that level where it's, yeah. it's not an unreasonable risk to put yourself on the top of a rocket and, and go into space. Yeah, there's plenty of uh, launching companies developing different technologies, like, for example, the relativity space, they're developing 3D printed uh, rockets. That is, I think that it's a really great idea. That is lowering the, the cost of, long, of a whole launch and then um, really uh, decrease the price of the ticket to go. And yeah, there is uh, yeah, a lot of opportunities also coming from private space sector. For example, Axum, they recently did, um, attached uh, the module, uh, wanted their module to the ISIS, and then they welcome, welcome their first space tourists next year as they plan. Uh, so, and it's just, it's going to happen in our lifetime. It's going to happen that everybody can afford. I mean, relatively, like if you can sell your house, right? Or it's good, it's going to be priced like that, but still it's pretty much affordable to, to everybody if you can save money. Yeah. What, what do you think, Frank? Uh, what kind of technologies well, can, yeah, can accelerate our, um, you know, the state of becoming um, a multiple species? Yeah, I don't know what the technologies are going to look like in the future. I think it's striking that after 50 plus years of government space programs, it took private companies to create re reusable rockets. And obviously that's a milestone. You know, I think it was either Jeff Bezos or, or uh, Elon Musk said, the way we do the space program is like you have a Rolls Royce in New York and you drive it to San Francisco, and then you drive it into the ocean, and then you build another Rolls Royce and drive it across country. And he said, this is crazy to do this. Um, and yet, you know, many of the bigger companies and uh, national space programs said reusability is a pipe dream, and yeah. yet it's not. So what is the next step, you know, like that? I'm not sure. But I will say a couple of things, again, about private enterprise. A low-cost, high-access model is the only way commercial enterprise is going to make it work because they, they need volume. And, uh, you know, when I, when I interviewed Sir Richard Branson for the last edition of my book, he was really explicit. He said, I want to democratize space, and I'm using the model I understand, and it's going to be like the airline industry where – Originally, it was barnstormers, and then it was rich people, and now everybody. Uh, it's not it's not extraordinary to fly. So I think that you know that's going to be the model, and it's going to encourage reducing costs and finding those new technologies. Yeah, I would say maybe and posit one more beyond the mobility technologies is an understanding of how to pr better protect either on a preventative measure or to correct the human body from radiation damage. Right. So before we send many, many people, before it's ethical to democratize access to an environment where there's so much harm to be done to the human biology, we do need to think about better radiation protection for deep space. Right. You know, one other thing we haven't talked about a lot is, uh, do you know about the company Offworld? Ariel, you may have come across Offworld. Yeah, it's a yeah, Pasadena-based company uh, is uh, mining uh, robotics technology developing developed, right? Well, you know, their vision is that the only way this is going to work is to send out fleets of AI-driven autonomous robots who can prepare the way for humans. So mm -hmm. the idea of humans going to Mars, say, and trying to build radiation protective habitats, they're not going to make, yeah. you know, the robots don't care. Send them, they'll be, they'll do it. And I haven't heard much talk about that except from that company, but I do think it's, it's part of the solution because Ariel, you're right. I mean, 
we're not made for that environment. Um, and, and we just, we like to kind of slough over that problem and just, exactly. yeah, we'll figure it out. But again, architects, designers, that's what they do. Uh, yeah. and that's what they're good at. Yeah. And of course, when we think about designing buildings for life here on Earth, there are all kinds of codes and ways that we have to build them to keep the inhabitants healthy. And it'll be a, an interesting challenge to be able to answer that same ethical consideration as a space architect. And I heartily agree. Sending probes and robots to be able to be forward advanced and prepare habitats, I think, is a makes a, a great case. And NASA, I'm seeing them in some of the solicitations that we're looking at as a research group applying for, you know, part of the lead up to the big Artemis missions, really are encouraging us to think about autonomy and robots and how can we how can we use systems ahead of time to pre-build and pre-prepare habitats or infrastructure on the lunar surface. And I'm sure that would be then we're thinking about how, already how we can do moon to Mars. So how do we transition to that other environment as well? Um, and a plug for JPL, who has for decades been the leader of robotic, you know, missions yeah. in the solar system, and um, I happened to have the chance to work on the Mars 2020 rover a couple of years ago. So of course we're all fingers crossed to see how that launches this <laughs> summer. But a yeah. great example of a program that over the course of many years has given us so much insight into preparing to go to Mars, thanks to the many Mars rovers that have already been exploring for us. Yeah, I mean, you know, somebody recently said. Don't ask if Mars is inhabited. It is by robots. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and for a long time, there was this ridiculous debate between, I think it's ridiculous, between robots versus humans. I right. just think it's both. It's, it's all, both. It's all yeah. together. I mean, <laughs> yeah. We're all, we're all, we're all together on this. And, it, uh, you know, another field of activity that's exploding right now, kind of like space exploration, is artificial intelligence. Yeah. And it's all happening at just the right time for, for right. AI and space to come together. I'm very optimistic as well to see us in the space industry be able to leverage these developments really well. Yeah. I think it is a very good time. Yeah. Um, for, forgive me, I have a hard stop at 3 p.m., so I just want to say I will need to sign off in a minute or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to yeah, stay yeah. on until the last minute. but. Yeah, Great so to see yeah, you, we're have, yeah, we're gonna have one last question, but yeah, please, Ariel, feel free to sign off. We understand that you're super busy, and thank you so much for taking your time for answering the question and presenting what you're doing uh, at MIT Media Lab. Uh, this is really exciting, and I look forward to have other discussions with you in the future, maybe collaborations. And yeah, please, uh, yes, yeah, follow the Twitter. Uh, sorry, follow them on Twitter. And yeah, um, thank you so much. Thank we'll you, ask, my uh, pleasure. Yeah, we will reply to one question, okay. and we're gonna yeah we're gonna yeah bye, end up the session. Bye 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 bye. bye, bye. So Frank, uh, there's a question. Once we master space technologies, a uh, burner spheres and O'Neill cylinders will be the best optimal habitats for humans. Are you agree? Could you say that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it. once we master space technologies, are burnout spheres and O'Neill cylinders going to be the best optimal solutions for humans? Do you agree? Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, I think that the the best answer, you know, one of the questions is really going back to is the surface of a planet the best place to to build? One of the questions we need to look at is whether, for example, on Mars and the moon, underground is going to be the best place. Oh, we yeah. Haven't, we haven't really talked about subterranean habitats. And I think those have to be thrown into the mix, especially because of the radiation issue. So I, I don't really know what's going to be the best way to go. I guess whatever robots can build, <laughs> that would be my answer. <laughs> yeah, there's some companies out there developing, um, like uh, there's a company called uh, Spaceport, oh no, Gateway Foundation. I think they're developing uh, this huge um, tourist uh, habitat. Mm -hmm. um, however, yeah, I think we're gonna start modular. We're gonna, as 
I think it's going to be more like axiom approach what they're doing. So they're going to utilize a few modules from the ISIS. that still uh, mm. will be uh, um, okay to use. Like they, because yeah, as you might know, the ISIS is going to be um, out of business really soon, in like maybe in seven or eight years. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I think it's going to be modular system, you know, step by step. And you don't need to have these huge stores because stores, uh, it's extremely expensive and it's not really efficient to build. But like if you, if you for example, start like uh, building this module, do this module, module, and then you don't really need to have this, uh, you know, rounded shape uh, station. You could have one module here, one module here, so it would be enough to facilitate gravity. And then you can have a port between them. So it, it, yeah, so some of the concepts like that in the internet, well, it's, a, it's a really good uh, question to reflect on. Um, it's also a uh, blue origin, the building, um, Joe Bezos is planning to build his own uh, orbiting space city, which is, I saw the pictures from the presentation. They like, they show the Europe cities, like they show all these best places of earth. And uh, to me, um, I don't really think that is a really great approach to place the parts of, of Earth to to what we call orbital city mm. to kind of replicate what we're gonna leave. Yeah. So it just you know this orbital space station. There's so much you know. There's just there's so much freedom to explore, and there might be no, new games uh, developed, new like uh, sports involved. So this is. This is yeah, really great topic to discuss, and I'm um, really excited to be part of it. To, to actually, um, I'm gonna have actually a call with Axiom Space, uh, uh, helping. Uh, I'm I'm hoping I will help somehow with um, with their design solution. Anyway, yeah, thank you so much, Frank, for your time. Oh, my pleasure. It's, it's a pleasure. It's also a pleasure to talk to you today. And let's stay in touch. That's a really wonderful topic. We could discuss it over and over again. And I think that it would be uh, uh, great to have you as a one guest, maybe like kind of an interview, like one hour interview. Sure. I, I see that people like it a lot because there's so many questions need to be asked. So yeah. yeah. I'd be happy to come back. I mean, what I love about space exploration is the questions never end. And yeah. every, everybody has an opinion, and I just think we're going to try a lot of different ways of doing this, and we'll probably stumble on the best solution. But hey, that's what humans do, and I think we're going to we're going to be very, very uh, effective ultimately uh, as we become citizens of the universe, which is our goal. Exactly, this is our goal. Like this common, the joint goal that we should pursue, like the whole humanity should pursue. And no more than ever before we understand, we are realized that we are all together in the same boat. We are all the same and there's no nations, just all these boundaries are artificial. And yeah, that's 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 really why space exploration, it, um, it's why it inspires me uh, to work uh, within the space operation field because mm. it really brings the understanding of uh, you know the whole the, the the overview effect, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful time to be alive, and then I wish that exactly. uh, you know I wish I were about thirty years younger, so I'd have more time to uh, play the infinite game. <laughs> infinite game. <laughs> Let's talk about like, would you would you like to live forever or what's the purpose of life? Okay, well, it's a it's yeah. a next topic. It's yeah. next topic for the next well, conversation. Okay, take care. Okay, take care. Thank you so much. Bye, for all the attendees, yeah, you can stay here. It's gonna be network session. Uh, you can speak to each other. I'm not gonna end up the session, so you can yeah find your future employers or like chat about anything sci-fi yeah just i think that it's really a great time to find like minds and uh, have a con conversation so okay um thank you again
Bye, Anastasia. Bye-bye. Thank you.